It's Andre from the High Performance Academy and we're here with Tony Palo from T1 Race. Now, Tony's a bit of a legend in the Honda drag racing scene and uh, he's been around for a while. Uh, Tony, I just wanted to sort of start with how you actually got into tuning. Can you tell us, tell us how you got involved? Yeah, I, uh, when I was in high school I bought a Honda Civic because I thought they were cool looking and uh, I didn't know that they could be fast. Turns out eventually they can be. So bought some stuff for it, souped it up, it was still slow, bought an Integra. And I ended up, while I was in high school, getting a job uh, at a performance shop. And I started there. And this was back when, you know, you would put headers and exhaust on your car and you were hot shit. So, you know, I started in the beginning. And uh, when, we, when I started tuning, it was adjustable fuel pressure regulators and adjusting cam gears. And, you know, you kind of couldn't go wrong. And it was a naturally aspirated four-cylinder, so you couldn't hurt it. And so, slowly but surely, aftermarket fuel injection started coming out and getting popular. And... Uh, first one I tuned was a DFI Gen 6, which if you've tuned, you know, is a nightmare. And uh, it just went up from there. So I kind of just got to learn the new things as they come out, rather than starting from here, uh, not knowing anything, trying to jump into it today. It's a little more capable now. So you, you sort of just started building up your knowledge, basically, as you were tinkering along with your own car? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, you know, oh, there's this new thing, we'll try this. And uh, between my car or a customer's car, everything was so low powered back then and, and so new, nobody knew what they were doing. You know, we were all learning it and I've just always been one that I, I just, I want to know how it works, I want to know why it works and just pushed and learned. And I think that's a, a theme I've seen with a lot of the people we've talked to as well. Uh, back back then, you, as you were saying, you, you're basically dealing with maybe a 150, 160 horsepower engine, naturally aspirated, no turbochargers and really it's going to be pretty hard to hurt that thing. So. It's kind of the ideal basis to, to get involved and learn how to tune. These days, uh, guys coming into the industry are jumping straight in the deep end with six, seven, eight hundred horsepower cars, and it's not so easy. No, no, no. I, I try and you know I get friends that are interested and I want to want to tune something. I want to learn, and I'm like, look, go buy a stock car, and play with it. And <laughs> you're not going to hurt it, but don't take a customer's car in and try to make 800 horsepower when you don't know what you're doing because it's not going to end well. That's some really sound advice, and I think a lot of people could uh, take that on board. What have you seen as the advances like that have come, come about with EFI over the years you've been involved, and how important have those advances been? Uh, well, you know, when we started, it was extremely basic. You know, we had a basic fuel map and a couple comps, and what seems like really new technology to us in the aftermarket has been going on in the OEM side for years, you know? So we're just getting closer and closer to what the OEMs have. And, you know, it's all about full control. Uh, you know, you can make it operate correctly in every condition you can imagine and safety provisions. And it's just a, a, a higher level of control than what we used to have. Let's talk a little bit about your Integra drag car. So, you know, you're talking a turbocharged engine, front wheel drive, which is a big challenge and uh, some serious power. First of all, how quick did you go in that Integra? Uh, quickest TT was 8.32 at 189 miles an hour. Okay, so 8.3, that's already fast, but uh, 189 mile an hour probably tells a little bit more about how much power that, that engine was really producing. Getting serious power to the track in a front wheel drive car what sort of challenges are you facing with that? Uh, a lot. So picture your truck in reverse trying to go somewhere with any kind of power. Um, traction was the name of the game. Obviously, we had the power. Uh, at the weight and power we had, if we were rear-wheel drive, you know, we would have been easy second quicker. So it was a constant battle. I started doing uh, front-wheel drive drag race stuff around year 2000. And, you know, again, we started out with low power and we, we worked our way up. So we learned a lot over the years. And, uh, you know, by the end of it, we were limited to a 26-inch tire and um, carved 60-foot low 1.4s, which for a front-wheel drive car without wheelie bars was pretty good. And uh, it took some creative traction control strategies that helped us out. And, you know, the car, if at that track that day was running 830s, it was going to run an 830 every pass. And so that, that was nice. Can you tell us a little bit about the traction control strategies and how you're making that work to, to get that power to the track? Yeah, so we used a Motec ECU, which uh, gives a lot of flexibility as far as what you want to do, how you want to control things. And um, a closed loop PID traction control is difficult to set up on a, on a drag car that's extremely overpowered. So basically we uh, came up with just using a, a rev limiter. So we just phased in a rev limiter versus ground speed and we would just plot the amount of slip we wanted in there and 
it was a done deal. The rev control algorithm took care of it, and you didn't have to dial anything in. It's nice. So once you had that thing set up, did you actually have to adjust it at the track, or is it that just done and dusted, don't even worry about uh, it again? It was completely done, but I would constantly toy with the launch and second gear stuff to play with different amounts of slip and you know see what went quickest. It was every time that car went down the track, it was different. I, I, I wouldn't leave the thing. If I left it the same, it would run the same every time, and that's not cool. It's always that challenge of trying to find that little uh, that little bit extra to make it go quicker, obviously. So with with that traction control off the line, at what point was the car actually hooked up, and could you apply full power to it? Uh, we couldn't apply full power until third gear. Yeah, that's really going to limit you. <laughs> okay, so I, I understand as well, you know, you, your success with that car, basically uh, just about everyone who's out there running front wheel drive, drag cars, particularly Hondas with a Motec, is kind of using that same iteration of your traction control strategy, is that right? Uh, yeah, I would be pretty comfortable saying 80 or 90% of the front wheel drive Hondas here have a, a derivative of my map. You obviously were doing something right. So moving on, uh, you, you're now sort of seeing the light, I guess, and moved away from front-wheel drive drag cars, and uh, R35 GDRs are the big thing. So how do you make a switch from going from uh, the Honda drag car field to, uh, to R35 modification? Uh, about four years ago, I, I obviously had seen the GTR. I thought it was a really cool car and scrounged up some money and bought one myself and started playing with it. And I remember driving it home from the dealership. I was... I was ecstatic driving home, and I was like, this is perfect. I'm not going to touch it. I love it. And uh, two weeks later, I had exhaust and turned the boost up and was running it out the Texas Mile. And, uh, you know, it just went from there. You can, as a shop, you know, we can work on customers' cars and do this and that. But at the end of the day, if you really want to showcase your ability, you gotta, you got to have full control over the whole program. And that's pretty much my car turned into the shop project car. And, you know, you can tell somebody you're good and, they can believe you or not, but you can show somebody you're good and they can't deny that. Yeah, it's definitely the best way to, to prove your capabilities. Uh, talking about engine management with the R35, I mean, they're one of the more advanced, probably the most advanced car currently out of Japan. You've got uh, electronic control of a six-speed transmission as well. Uh, what sort of uh, engine management strategies are you using? Uh, we use Cybex first. Well, we, we do Cobb access port on the stock ECU. Uh, at some point, six injectors weren't enough. We need a 12, we need a better traction control. Uh, the Cybex was the first one to market with that. Put that in a bunch of cars, it's a great system. Uh, and then Motec finished their package for the GTR with the 12 injector control. Uh, I've got that on my car now, and it's by far the most in-depth uh, system I've ever tuned and worked with, and it's really well laid out. Everything works like it's supposed to. For a street car versus something a bit more serious, like obviously your own car with 12 injectors, would going to that Motec or Cyvex um, ECU option over a Cobb access port reflash, does that actually offer you any advantages? Um, it does. The, uh, the fueling control, the ignition control, you know, what you have to keep in mind is the stock ECU has thousands of tables. We have control of 15 of them. So what else is really going on? And you know, when I'm running 45 pounds of boost, uh, I wanna know what I'm telling it to do for ignition timing is what it's doing every time. And then there's not some random comp somewhere. So the consistency is a lot better. The power is better, the traction control, the launch control, the logging, there's, there's a lot of advantages to it. 45 pound of boost, I hear you mention that number. That's a hell of a lot of boost. Can you tell us what sort of power you're actually producing out of your own GDR or even your more powerful customer cars? Uh, we've got them over 1,500. Uh, we've got, you know, these cars are, they're boats. They're over 4,000 pounds. Uh, so far, I've seen 172 miles an hour on the track. Uh, low three seconds, 60 to 130 times. So they're moving. Uh, you know, once you get at that power, if you don't have a hub dyno, uh, all bets are off. Uh, we run into all kinds of traction problems with the dyno. And between traction problems and it trying to drive off the dyno in big power, it's pretty wild. I, I don't push them real hard on the dyno. We've seen the, the GDR tuning market really explode with cars going you know, sort of low eight second passes and again as you say they're, they're a whale of a car, they're seriously heavy and that's uh, 1500 horsepower is a lot of power to be pushing as well. Where, where do you see the limitations at the moment with GDR tuning? Uh, I, for a lot of our customers builds, uh, this car at a thousand wheel horsepower, it's fast and it's fun but it's not scary at all. It's the most controlled, smooth, seamless thing and so Somebody who's driven a car with 500 horsepower gets in a 1,000 horsepower car, 
and they get this initial rush that lasts about a week and then they're coming back going, I need more. It's not scary, it's not out of control. So around 1250 is a magic number for, I mean, a dead reliable street car that you can have fun with. It's not out of control. Uh, as far as past that, you know, you go to the track, you put slicks on it, they'll take more power and they'll make more power. Uh, at 15, 1600, we haven't found another weak link yet, so we're going to keep going up and see what happens. It's insane to see how far they've come. And I mean, a few years ago, talking about having a thousand wheel horsepower or 1250 wheel horsepower in a streetable car that, as you say, is reliable, was, was just unheard of. So it's, it's really amazing what the tuning industry has done with these GDRs. And uh, I congratulate you on your achievements there, Tony. Look, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah, thank you. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.